Welcome everybody to the first wet pixel underwater photography hangout on Google+. Uh, my name is Eric Chang. I'm publisher of Wet Pixel and uh, director of photography at Lytro. And uh, I've been taking pictures, uh, taking pictures underwater for uh, about um, 13 years now. Is that right? No, 11 years. It's hard to count past 10. <laughs> uh, and we have a, a great group here, although most of us are, are disguised. <laughs> Maybe we should get rid of these things. Um, but let's, uh, why don't we introduce ourselves from left to right. So, uh, Adam? Hi, yeah, I'm, I'm Adam Hanlon. I'm the, uh, I'm the editor of WebPixel. Um, and I also um, have a dive school that I run in the UK. Um, I'm a South African. I've been down for a very long time. And um, I started taking pictures, actually, I think probably more like 25 years ago with a Nikonis 5 and some film. And pretty soon realized that I was no good at it. And, uh, and then, uh, but to the digital era, just got into it again. And I've been taking pictures with uh, digital cameras pretty much solidly for the past, I don't know, eight to ten years, something like that. And, and yeah, I'm still, uh, still fascinated by everything that's underwater and the whole underwater experience and, and trying to capture it. And, uh, yeah, I like to do a little bit of video and stuff as well. Okay. Great, Alex. Hi, I'm Alex Mustard, um, and I'm an underwater photographer from the UK. Um, I've been taking underwater pictures since I was very young. It's always been my my interest, my, my passion. Um, I notice I'm not coming up on the screen, or am I on everyone else's screen? There you go. Okay, I still see Eric, but that's fine. Um, it's probably best not to see me anyway. Um, <laughs> I am currently, um, I've always been a Nikon SLR shooter, but I do enjoy trying other systems, and hopefully one of the things we'll talk about today is I've just been trying the new Olympus OMD EM5 uh, Micro Four Thirds system. Um, which I, I found fascinating to use, um, and certainly it raises questions about what the future is for high-level cameras for underwater stills photography. Okay, Burke. Uh-oh, we don't have audio on Berkeley. Let me uh, start by turning my mic on. <laughs> 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 So, hello everyone. It's a real honor to uh, be among friends here in uh, chatting away. Um, my name is Berkeley White, and I'm the founder of Backscatter. Started Backscatter in 1994, and we're a, a, a big retail um, company. But I also <clears throat> dabble quite a bit with um, shooting both stills and video on the personal side, and really look forward to uh, sharing, um, you know, some technology and maybe some some diving tips and tricks um, while, we, while we chat today. So thanks for joining in. Ryan. Great. My name is Ryan Cannon, one of the founders of Reef Photo and Video in Fort Lauderdale. Um, we are also a retailer of underwater imaging gear. We also import Nauticam into the United States, and we manufacture the line of Zen domes. Mike Berkeley, I sell underwater imaging gear for a living and I travel and take pictures for fun. Great. Well, where, is, where are we all? Uh, one, th one of the th things that's great about Hangouts is that you know, we really have no idea where you are. Uh, so <laughs> we have Adam. Adam's in the UK in a place that I've just learned to pronounce but probably can't recall. <laughs> Adam? Yeah, it's, it's a place called Cape and Ray. It's, uh, it's an inland dive site near Lancaster in the north of England. Great. Alex, where are you? I'm, I'm also in the UK. Um, I'm down here to, um, I'm down in the southwest of the UK hoping to go out and shoot basking sharks tomorrow. But the, the weather isn't looking too great. So we may sneak out tomorrow, but finding sharks when it's rough is never, never easy. So I haven't got high hopes. Right, and Berkeley's in Monterey there. I'm in, in California. And uh, I'm in San Francisco. Ryan? I'm in my office in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Great. So what we wanted to talk about today is, uh, or are a few things. The first um, are all of these new cameras we've been testing and reviewing. Uh, it's been a pretty exciting year for, for underwater photography because cameras continue to change at an incredible rate. And of course, they make their way uh, underwater fairly quickly. And I was actually really surprised this time at how fast, um, how fast these cameras made it underwater. Um, so I thought the first camera we could talk about are the new cameras out 
uh, by Nikon, the D800 and the D4. You know, they're sort of higher end SLRs and quite a few of you have uh, experience with this camera. Um, so maybe we could, you know, we could start by talking about those cameras. Um, does anyone want to want to go first? I'll jump in if people are okay with that because yeah, I've been, uh, I, I'm busy actually in, in the midst of reviewing the D800. Um, uh, it's underwater performance and, and, and the more I use it, the more I think it's probably a game changer for um, underwater imaging. Um, a lot of the issues around the, the massive amount of resolution that it gives um, and the detail in the images um, seems to be most of the time no way a benefit to create detail images that was very difficult to achieve before. Um, the other thing, of course, is that because you've got so much resolution and so much information in each image, that it opens a whole new um, technique of shooting to crop, which, to be honest, I'm still finding struggle to adapt to, but I still tend to look through a viewfinder and try and capture what's in the viewfinder. But there is a whole new um, way that we'd have to look at capturing images, which is based on shooting and accepting that we're going to take a lot of that information away and just use portions of the image. I think that's going to change the way we take images. I think, I think it's inevitable that the other manufacturers will follow along with similar, type, similar resolutions in their cameras. And you know, these techniques are going to become more and more accepted and more, more and more widespread. Um, it, it, you know, it has other advantages too. Um, things like the, the camera's tonal range seems amazing. Um, we did some test shoots, I know, that, uh, that are now posted in the review. And the... Uh, the, the, the Tonal range that we can get out of it, the, and capturing the detail back in the shadows that, that isn't apparently there again is phenomenal. So it does seem like a really amazing uh, camera for underwater use. And I'm going there. to be a bit provocative and just, just I guess as much for the sake of, of chat. And and I, I wanted to talk about the dynamic range issue. In that, I mean, I had I was fortunate that I had the chance to try a pre-production. Um, D800 back in, in January in the Cayman Islands, not underwater but on land, and was hugely impressed with it to the point that I found the ISO so incredible, even with that resolution, that I dared not comment about it online, partly because of the, the NDAs, but also because I just didn't believe what I was seeing, that the 36 megapixel could be so good at high ISO, and I thought if I write this on the forums now, everyone's going to laugh at me in six months' time. Um, but on the dynamic range issue, I mean, the camera is really, really phenomenal. But I do think we do get a bit hung up on dynamic ranges underwater photographers because of this whole sunburst thing that people often talk about. And I do think we can put too much emphasis on it. I remember some of the, I remember Burke a couple of years, Berkeley a couple of years ago, shot some fantastic sunbursts in Indonesia with the the, the Canon 7D, which. If you look at the scores of the Canon 7D on, on the various websites, it's not a great dynamic range camera, yet a good photographer was getting brilliant sunbursts. And I think with the sunburst issue, it's important to remember that a lot more, um, it's not just the case that dynamic range gets you a great sunburst. The right in-water techniques make a big difference in terms of managing the dynamic range that you're asking the camera to deal with in the way that you compose and put the picture together. And I think it's important, you know, not to lose sight of that fact. Obviously, we want to take the best tool down with us, but actually what creates a good sunburst underwater is, is finding the right conditions and putting the picture together in the right way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'd, I'd chime in on that. I, you know, the one thing that I caught myself doing in trying to shoot sunburst is, uh, you know, I kept, you know, pointing the camera up at the sun, but then... I finally realized that, well, if there's no sunburst to take a photo of, you can't take a photo of a sunburst. <laughs> and so, you know, if there's no light rays, you can't capture the light rays. You know, there's a, this kind of mythology in underwater photography that if you shoot, you know, one one twenty-fifth of a second, you'll get light rays. And it's, you know, not the case, certainly with digital, but it's also not the case with, with uh, you know, you know, I guess underwater photography in general. So I, I kind of kept catching myself trying to milk sun rays out of, out of nothing. Um, and, and on that topic, you know, one thing that, you know, we all do now is, you know, we tend to shoot shallow to get a sunburst. And so usually in, in fairly shallow water where you can actually see the, the surface of the water. So, you know, if you can see the waves and see detail, you know, then you can actually capture some level of detail. Um, and, but you got to shoot it at f22 and, you know, maximum shutter speed. So I think Alex is, is on point that, um, you know, the, 
the you know we, we all we've had to like change our techniques to just even get sunburst out of digital and and I don't know if we'll truly ever get that um, dynamic range that you know we used to believe we had with film. I, I think that's all absolutely true. I think I think that that. There's no camera in the world that will let you get images that aren't there, first of all, and secondly, that the, 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 the D800's resolution actually is probably quite unforgiving in this respect. But I, I do think that it, it, it will, it gives, it opens up opportunities that probably weren't there before. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. Whether whether you have the technique and, and the subject, indeed, to actually develop those opportunities is, a, is, a, is another issue. Um, it, it does. It strikes me that, that certainly getting really good sunburst sun seems to seems to come easier, possibly with a D800. Uh, could, am I able to share a couple of pictures? Um, because just on this sunburst issue, there's um, some photos that I've, I've never put in an article or, or, or shown online, um, but I do use them in the talks I give on, on photo workshops. And I, I did a, a series of pictures just just in the Cayman Islands, swimming up from a depth of 15 meters, which is 50 feet up to the surface and shooting the sun every three meters up. Um, and if I can share the pictures easily, I'm not sure I'll be able to, let me just screen share, see if my picture will change to the window that I'm in. Um, let's have my whole computer. Sorry, I think I'm there. Hopefully now I should have changed to a computer screen. Um, and just to compare, at depth, this is down deep, and this is a sunburst, hopefully that's come up. Mm. Um, it's a pretty horrible sunburst. It's a blob with a big cyan circle around it. Um, exactly the same conditions and, and time. Get up shallow. This is now at 15 feet. And up at 15 feet, exactly the same reef, same time, same weather, same settings. Suddenly now I've got all the sun rays. I've lost the cyan halo. Um, and it really comes in at about that six, seven meters depth, which is that, that 20 foot depth range and, and above. Um, and generally, I think peters out by about two meters. I think once you're within five five feet of the surface, it's, it it becomes not as pleasing as sun. Um, I just thought that was worth sharing. I'm going to turn my screen share off again. Well, if I can, uh, if I can just, I, I, you should have a um, a window coming up for me now as well, which is an image that I took. It is very shallow, um, and uh, in fact, it's it's probably two three meters. Um, and but obviously, you know, again, the, the sort of tonal range, and I think to some extent the uh, the clarity of the light. And and I have to be honest and say that this was a very early dive with this camera. I didn't I didn't set out to achieve sunburst. I was just trying it out and pointing it in different directions, seeing what I came up with. So so this wasn't the kind of shot that I spent a lot of time thinking about composing and and adjusting. I just got it exposed as well as I could and shot it, and that's what came out. And uh, you know, and I think. Um, I think that that really probably illustrates the camera's camera's capabilities quite well. <laughs> I'm, I'm hopefully if, if things come together, I look forward to trying it in warmer waters um, soon too. I sent my D800 first D800 sample to Kerry Wilk about a month ago. Actually, having a lot of trouble getting it back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, luckily, he is feeding back some some photos. Um, Share the screen now. So that's coming through? Yes. yes. OK, cool. Looks pretty deep, similar to what Alex showed from the deeper uh, sun wall with lack of rays. But he does have some photos shallower. Tent, but the cyan doesn't go crazy ugly, which, which is nice. Uh, that's lovely. There's nice and shallow, nice rays. Uh, actually, I love this shot. Uh, you don't actually have the sunball in the photo, but the, the dappled light rays behind the turtle as a backdrop, I think, are pretty awesome. Uh, this is actually from the Cenotes in Mexico. The first few photos I showed were from his Nile of Ford in Fiji. Um, well, one thing I've noticed is that there are announcements from virtually every manufacturer supporting the D800. And you know we don't always see every manufacturer support every housing, although you know these cameras come out so infrequently that they seem to be supporting everyone. But are, are you seeing uh, a lot of uh, interest in the D800 from the community? C can I answer this before the um, 
before the the the, the um, before the, the boys get in on it, was uh, um, Jean from Aquatica when I saw him in London um, back in the end of March, beginning of April. He was saying that he he noticed something different from his D800 um, customers compared to his other housings. They were working obviously on a D4 and a, a 5D um, up at Aquatica as well. And he said the D800 guys were the most impatient. They all wanted it now, now, now. Whereas the other two were kind of, get it right, and when it's ready, we'll get it. But the, the, the 800 people were the impatient ones. But it, it used to be common practice to have to wait six months or even more to get the housing for a new camera release. And manufacturers have really stepped up their game, and now it's not unreasonable to expect to have a production all nigglies worked out of a housing you know, within 90 days of the camera starting shipping. So we're making very impatient customers. Well, and I think the you know the interesting thing with the D eight hundred is uh, you know like Alex, I've been a Nikon shooter for years and years, and, and a lot of our client base at Backscatters um, kind of been Nikon centric, and the D eight hundred is really the first exciting Nikon camera to come out in many many years. You know, kind of the D seven thousand was phenomenal camera. I think it is still a great camera, but it wasn't that one camera that made you say, "Wow, I'm going to get rid of my." D200, D300, D2X, you know, whatever you might be shooting, and so I think the 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 form, the, you know, the the you know the D800, you know, is is kind of like a, you know, it's a it's a pretty small camera body, so it's you know it's one that you know fits in your hand, it's something you can still carry around, and and it's phenomenal for you know an icon user to finally find something that's you know high resolution, so you can crop. And you know, as Alex said, really surprisingly low low noise um, in a in a reasonable size. So I you know I think that's why we're really seeing more impatient people or people really you know just basically because it's so exciting to finally get a great Nikon body out. Yeah, when I look through the pre-order list at the Reef Photo Store, it's D2X customer, D2X customer, D2X customer. And to be very fair to those guys, they've been waiting for a long time, so they have been patient. Quite patient. Right. <laughs> One thing I would say, a point Ryan made, was how quickly now we see housings for cameras. And two of the last big reviews I've done for WetPixel, which was the, the D7000 Nikon and, and, and most recently the D4, we published both of those reviews before the big camera website DP Review had their reviews up for that camera. Yeah. It's amazing now how quickly we're you know, getting houses and cameras underwater that we're actually doing reviews now at the same time as the top side guys. Which is, you know, it's very exciting from a wet pixel point of view. It means you can't cheat as much and just read what they read. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we move on to Canon's latest offering, the. the hey, Eric, do um, yeah. you mind if I, I throw in one yeah, more thing about, um, you know, one thing is people are upgrading from, you know, crop sensor cameras. So, you know, maybe there's a lot of uh, D200, D300 shooters, um, you know, D2, D2X shooters that have kind of fallen in love with the Tokina 10-17 to lens. And so now a lot of people are looking at these full-frame SLRs and kind of saying, oh, but I, you know, I want to keep my, you know, this lens that I love. And so kind of the, the nice thing that Canon has, has done, I'm sorry, Nikon has done, is you, know, you can do in-camera cropping. So you could still you know, shoot a 10-17 to and have that, that versatility of a wide-angle zoom. And, and the resolution is still holds up you know, really well. So, so I think you know what we're seeing is quite a few people, um, you know, not really thrilled with the, the wide-angle lens options in full frame. You know, it's kind of going to they're going to be shooting their their wide-angle in, in in a DX mode in, on the D800, and then their for their macro they'll be shooting full frame, which makes a lot of sense because in macros where you know you might be doing a lot of cropping. And one thing with the D800 is it looks like, you know, you can really crop a vertical out of a horizontal and, and still be, you know, at the same, you know, kind of resolution that you get out of a D7000 or, or a, a traditional DX, you know, crop camera. So I think that's, it's kind of adds some flexibility to the, to the D800 as well. No, that's a really co good point, Burke. I, I went from full frame to crop sensor, and one of the big reasons uh, was that Tokina 10-17. to and now that I'm thinking about moving back to the 5D Mark III for full frame again, um, I think I'm going to miss that lens a lot, uh, you know, because I'll, I'll be back to 15 millimeter fisheye. And on the Canon side, there's no, you know, sort of DX shooting equivalent on the full frame cameras. 
I, I'd, I'd say I make a slightly different point. It's a point I, I men mentioned in the the D4 review on WebPixel is that when you switch over to that in-camera crop mode on on the, the Nikon bodies, you do end up with quite a small viewfinder, and particularly inside a housing, it's not the world's greatest view. And I do think you're almost better leaving it in. Um, you know, is maybe shooting to crop, and instead of maybe using the 1017, put on a, a, a 15 or 16 mil fisheye on the D800 and shoot to crop. So, you know, you shoot at full frame. If you don't fill the frame, you know you can crop rather than going over to the 1017 and committing yourself to DX before the dive. I think generally for wide angle, though, on full frame, for the, you know, it's a very important point with a lot of people now going over to full frame digital cameras is you can't afford to cut corners uh, optically, particularly if you want to shoot the wide rectilinear lenses. You've really got to pay the money and invest in good dome ports and things like that. You know, there's no point buying a D800 and then thinking you can get by with a, you know, some old dome port you've been using for a long time that isn't maybe the best. You've really got to get things set up right. Um, and you know, the dealers can tell you exactly what to get, and it's really not an area to cut corners if you want to get the most out of those cameras. And of course, another option is to run the you know fisheye lenses, you know, like the eight to fifteen Canon with the the teleconverter, or or you know what what I run quite a bit is a, a Sigma fifteen with a teleconverter, and so you can kind of have one lens with a teleconverter that'll get you both full frame fisheye and um, you know like a hundred and thirty degree um, kind of lens. And and Alex really is the guy who kind of pioneered a lot of this teleconverter um, you know tools uh, and. Uh, so I, you know, question for Alex: Have you played? Did you have you played with with any, you know, anything like a teleconverter with a Tokina um, or anything like that on the D800? Um, I, I played with it on the D3 and, and 700 series, and it definitely affected the autofocus because those cameras, you know, weren't as good at at, at um, with a um, a slower aperture lens. One of the great things about the D800 and, and the D4 is the autofocus is very, very good um, with slower lenses. And I think that might may well make that work better. I have to say, though, I don't miss the... the I'm a strange one. I guess because I shoot a bit more scenery than, than animals. Um, but I don't miss the 10 to 17 that much. And I think as a lot of D800 users, before they start thinking about maybe trying to house their 10 to 17, is do a trip with a straight fisheye except some shots you might have to crop. And just, just try it like that before you, you start going down the line of trying to create lots of different um, ways of solving problems. Because you may find you actually quite like it. Yeah, I have a shooting the full frame fisheye and then just sorting it out in post. I mean, you might decide that you want 20, 30% crop. And it seems to me to make more sense to have that information on the card and in the laptop and sort it out later than it does to uh, only capture the center of the frame in the water. I scored a bold Pentax 17 to 28 fisheye on eBay this week. So see if I can maybe hack together some kind of a mount and, and you get your full frame 10 to 17 back. <laughs> <laughs> Just one more thing while I have focus. Um, I think that the highlight sunball sort of side of the dynamic range conversation is is a very important one. but. What I've been most blown away by from D4, especially in the shots that Alex took in Iceland, that Alex took in Iceland, are the shadow detail that's being pulled out of there, and also the D800 shots that the carry has from the San Jose. And I mean, there there has to be image uh, data that's that's recorded there that you guys can't even see through the viewfinder. That's really amazing to see once those things are brought into Lightroom and the the shadows are boosted a little bit. Just just how good that looks. And I'll leave on. Uh, I walked by our shipping department, and I think that there's going to be some happy D800 customers at the Refoto store, at the Backscatter store in the next couple of days. Good. Exciting. Oh, is Adam going to show something? Uh, yeah, this is a great example from Adam. Um, of his I'll shut up so his screen comes up. <laughs> Adam, uh, I think... Maybe I'm he's going to show, um, I know what he's going to show, so I'll speak until he starts speaking. Okay. Um, he's going to show some pictures um, taken, I think it's two, it's, yeah, it's, a two, two, it's the same, it's two versions of the same raw file, where he's lifted the shadows, um, and it's a picture taken you know, down deep in the UK, in spring, not in bright conditions, so it's already quite a low light picture. And the first picture shows it as shot, 
and the second one with the shadows lifted, and it's shot right into the sun, and it's this huge, di you know, dynamic range being shown. It's almost like an HDR shot. Adam, you able to show that? Okay, um, maybe we lost him. I've I've clicked on it, so he, viewers should be seeing his uh, his. That they're also within Adam's review on WebPixel, so people can go and check them out. Um, oh, we lost him. Yeah, that has been amazing. All of the examples I've seen of the dynamic range uh, are, are sort of something we've never seen before in an SLR, in, an, in a digital SLR. Um, and that's actually, you know, I'm not really thinking about switching to Nikon. In fact, I've gotten this question a lot recently because I'm selling a bunch of lenses and everybody thinks I'm switching to Nikon. Um, but I think if I were, you know, if I were a landscape shooter, just a topside landscape shooter, um, I would probably buy this camera even even if I were a Canon user, you know, buy it with a couple wide-angle lenses uh, and use it until until Canon responds. Um, but can, why don't we um, let's use that to talk about the Canon 5D Mark III uh, a little bit? I know some of you have been shooting it. Um, Burke, you've had it in the water, correct? Yeah, quite a bit. Do you want so to talk the, about that? Sure. So. Uh, you know, the housings weren't um, really shipping yet, and I think Nauticam is, is coming online pretty soon. We're going to, you know, here in a couple of weeks, we'll be at the digital shootout in Little Cayman, and so we'll have uh, actual um, Nauticam 5D Mark III and Aquatica um, 5D Mark III housings. What we did is basically um, spend a day kind of hacking a, a Mark III into a Mark II housing, so I had really limited control. Um, but what it was um, I was amazed at on the Mark III, mostly I, I kind of um, started shooting quite a bit of video, and that's what really got me onto the Mark II and, and now on the Mark III. And what I, uh, I did a trip to the Cenotes in Mexico, and, and the, the first um, time I was there, I, I didn't have a Mark III. The second time, I, I had the Mark III. And I, I found that ISO, um, you know, 1250 was really limiting um, me on, with the Mark II. And then on, this, on the second trip with the Mark III, I was able to shoot ISO 2500, and it, it was crazy good. And not only was, was I able to shoot ISO 2500, but I was able to um, edit um, and color correct um, the file in post, and it held up incredibly well. And I, let me see if I can do a, a quick um, screen share here. Oh, looks like I lost that window. Um, I'll, I'll pull that up in just a minute after when someone else is talking. But the uh, we were, you know, the, some of the images that we were able to, to capture just could not have been done, um, you know, with a Mark II. And I think the only, you know, maybe the D4 would be the closest, um, you know, or D800 uh, to, you know, to be able to pull out that much detail. Because what really, you know, in speaking of dynamic range, the first thing that falls apart is blue. You know, blue is the hardest thing for digital cameras to capture. And so as we start kind of pushing the limits, we start to get um, banding in the backgrounds of our, of our scenes. And so uh, at these high, high ISOs, we're able to... Um, capture um, really smooth um, blues that we just weren't able to do before. So that, to me, that was the most exciting thing about the, about the Mark III. Um, and it, land just, uh, you know, I don't know how many of you out there have, been, have shot a lot with the Mark II, but it, the, the Canon um, 5D Mark II always felt like it was, I don't know, like it was made 20 years ago. You know, like when you're, when you're shooting it from a photo standpoint, it would kind of go ka-clunk, ka-clunk. A clunk, you know, and, and now with a, a Mark III, it's doop, 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 you know, so it's like you know, it's the difference between like a bolt action rifle and a machine gun now. So it's if you're you know, for from a photography standpoint, it's now um, you know, it's it's a real camera, um, you know, it's it shoots a really fast frame rate, and the focus um, on the Mark II was always um, a little disappointing, um, and the Mark III now is just super zippy. And, and I even, um, you know, now uh, Canon has uh, uh, released uh, focus, like a live view focus. So when you're in live view shooting video, um, you can execute a, a focus that actually works really well even in macro. I was, I was very surprised. It, you still can't focus live while you're recording video, but you can do quick updates, and, and it and it's, feels very, very zippy. So it feels like, you know, you're really shooting a, a real modern 
SLR um, on the on, on the photo side, um, and then of course for me it's just that that the ability to shoot um, video at that higher bit rate and that the new uh, all I can um, format really gives you a lot of room in post, so you can really do um, you know corrections that you, we we as still photographers are used to doing to our raw files. I think now you can do. Um, 20, 30 percent of, of that kind of work um, to your video without, um, you know, having your image fall apart. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. I, I've not used the, the 5D Mark III, um, but actually as a spec camera, I, I find it very exciting. I do think that, I mean, I, I had the chance to try the, the D800 earlier in the year. Um, and it really made a mess of my hard drives. It, it produces such... Because there weren't raw converters for it at the time. I was shooting raw in JPEG, which wasn't helping. Um, but it really made me realize that, you know, if you're traveling and shooting a lot, particularly if you're, you know, a working um, photographer, you're often doing, you know, t one, two, three trips back to back. You know, you want to maximize your field time in the water shooting. You don't want to be on the computer having to delete images. And I do think it's something to be very aware of if you're buying a, a, you know, one of these newer cameras. And it's why I think that actually the 20 megapixel point is a very, very good sweet spot in terms of resolution. I know that there's, there's possibilities opened up by having even more. But I think if, if the dynamic range of the, the D700 was available in a, a 20 megapixel camera, I think I'd go for that every time rather than having to deal with 50 megabyte raw files every time I press the shutter. We had the 5D Mark III's in Bonaire, and uh, I was pretty amazed by the, some of the video clips that were taken in 200 feet of water at ISO 3200. Those are shared on WebPixel. Um, they look good in the Vimeo shares, and they look really good on screen. Um, and it's important to remember that camera has the same focus system as 1DX will have when 1DX is available. And, and I don't think Canon's ever done that before to put a Pro, pro body focus in a, in a mid range model, if you would call 5D Mark III mid range, upper mid range body. So it's pretty exciting camera. And it's, it's a shame that the D800 announcement has stolen some of its thunder when I, mean, I still think it's a superior video camera just from the then D8, over D800. Are you guys using uh, autofocus in live view or are you mostly manual using manual focus? All pre focus with the star button uh, with wide-angle lenses, and then for macro video, a, a bit of a mix. Sometimes if you're in a precarious re position, then you'll use focus on, on the back focus on the star button. Or if you're in an area where you can really kind of hunker down, then focus with a gear manual. Yeah, and I do the same thing. I, uh, typically with wide-angle video, you know, you just lock it. Um, you know, as long as you run a around an f-stop of about f8, and you can lock it at about a thin tip distance, and then pretty much everything's going to be in focus that, that you're running. And in macro, um, you know, as I mentioned, the you can use still use the live view focus, but as you know, you're kind of set up and you're all on on a tripod, and then just as you get everything dialed in, you know, your subject just boop, you know moves just out of focus, and that's where the on the Mark III you can, you know. Uh, activate live focus again, and it and it snaps where the where the the Mark II just would not do it. It would just hunt and hunt, and and so you kind of have to you know take a, quite a bit more time to, to reset a focus. In the in the in the cenotes, what I found is um, a lot of times I with the Mark II I'd have to light up my fin or light up a formation or something to, to reset a focus, and with the with the Mark III it it, it would snap on shadows that you know that kind of like was mentioned earlier, almost detail that I didn't really see with my eye, it was actually snap and focus on. So it was, it was really impressive. One, one more thing. That, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ryan. We're seeing a lot of concern from customers coming from, from crop sensor cameras about the ability to shoot macro, too. They think that they're stepping back to this like wide-angle medium format image all of a sudden. And that's really not proven to be the case. Um, I'll share a couple of shots really quickly that are just 100 millimeter macro shots with a plus 10 reef net sub C. So you're at like a 2 to 1 reproduction ratio here, and um, that's not too shabby for macro work. And there's also one that I got this morning from, from Kerry in Indonesia, I think we see this one. Again, 
they're working at minimum focus here, so about a 2 to 1 reproduction ratio, something just under 2 centimeters tall. Uh, these are not wide-angle, low reproduction ratio cameras. They can be very powerful macro tools as well. So I, I've got, sorry, I, I've got that image back up now that just, we, we kind of moved away from it for a bit, but I have got that image of the, um, the tonal range that you can get back with the, on the D800. Um, just, uh, I'll just pull it up now. Uh, I think it's probably worth looking at just for completeness of sake. Um, so that's the, that's the, that's the uh, unprocessed um, image. And then that's the processed image. So unprocessed process. So I mean, the level of detail that's been retained in the shadows is, uh, is stunning, really. Well, and I think um, bringing the D800 up again um, uh, brings up a really valid point. Is uh, one thing that we found in shooting video with both the the Nikon and the Canon bodies is uh, the the actual process of, of shooting a, or setting a manual white balance, um, which is you know a critical thing to do for video. Um, Canon's kind of kept it that process a bit simpler than Nikon, and so we found that um, on the on the uh, Nikon bodies, it's kind of a multi-step process, and it doesn't seem to snap white balance quite as good. So you tend to get a little color cast. Um, on the on the Nikon bodies, and and so it's something that um, you know we're still uh, you know for people that are like you know uh, choosing an, a digital SLR for a video tool, um, the Canon route seems to be a little better just for the, on the you know the white balance side, um, but you know with some pro really good technique on on setting manual white balances, then the Nikon image files look fantastic. Um, but it's just, it takes a, a few more steps, um, uh, you know, in, in an in a even better technique to get a good white balance on a, on a Nikon body when shooting video. Thanks, Burke. We, we have a question from uh, Nick Hope uh, over on, on Google+, and uh, he says, uh, as, a pr as primarily a videographer who takes quite a lot of macro, macro I'm holding back from full-frame cameras um, to see what replaces the Canon 60D and 7D. Um, and he's doing that because he believes they'll be more forgiving in terms of depth of field. So macro video on a full frame camera, 5D Mark III or D800, um, can you talk about whether you think the shallower depth of field makes it overly challenging? Can I just jump in quickly on that? Well, sorry, just to say that you can shoot the D800 and the D4 as DX cameras in video. So you can, you can use them as a DX camera. Right. That's a good point. <laughs> uh, I think Nick's on the Canon, Canon front. Burke, you want to talk about that? Well, and, and I think it's important to keep in mind that, um, you know, the depth of field um, issue is really uh, kind of a technique thing. Uh, if uh, the real trick with, with shooting macro videos to get your lights, you know, like this close. So um, usually what I do is I run... Um, in macro, I run like the Sola 1200s in spot mode, and I, I position the lights about six inches off the subject, and that allows me to shoot a f-stop of around f18 or higher. And then I usually use a ISO of um, you know 320, 640, something like that, because um, the the higher ISOs are, are very forgiving when you're when you're adding lights. So in a in macro video, you can actually maintain depth of field really well as long as you get your lights right on top of the subject. And I think what um, I see in a lot of our workshops that people kind of are trying to shoot their lights like they would normally a uh, still rig, and so the lights are kind of back on the camera, um, kind of in that traditional avoid backscatter um, position. But with um, when we need all the light we can get to to maintain those higher f stops, it's you know, really getting those lights. Um, right on top, kind of solves that issue. So I personally, I would, I, I wouldn't be concerned about um, depth of field. Uh, you know, at full frame versus DX. Um, I'd be more concerned about getting the brightest macro lights that you can get, and then you'll solve that problem um, pretty easily. And, and thus, I would rather shoot a, a full frame camera all the time just to minimize the noise, because the full frame cameras always have lower noise than the than the DX cameras. So that that would be my my choice. Whenever I see a... Uh, oh, 
Oh, just really quickly, whenever I see a macro photographer shooting video with, a, with one of these rigs and they have this lights, you know, like three inches from the subject, which I've done as well, and when you approach from far away, you know, it's fairly dark, it can be fairly dark down there and you see this, it's like a, you know, uh, I don't know, it's, a, it's like a, it's this huge spotlight you know, on a, a tiny animal and I always imagine it's a little shrimp or something and it just yeah. explodes into popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Alex. No, I, I was just going to pay, pay Nick a quick compliment in that um, I was um, in, in Sardinia in Italy recently and um, Eleonora's um, godfather made this big fuss that he really wanted to show me a, a video that he um, had been shared to him on YouTube and it was one of Nick's videos. Um, oh, and right. he, maybe he sat me down and made me watch this video because he thought it was the most beautiful video he'd ever seen underwater. So that was just, that just was for Nick. That was the depth of field. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, one of the, I think the beautiful things of shooting macro video with the full-frame cameras is, is actually using the short depth of field to make subjects pop more. And autofocus area is so so creamy with the 100 millimeter lens shooting something foot or you know 12 inch or 12 or 14 inches away. Uh, and the full-frame camera gives you more uh, flexibility to push the ISO and make the most of lights that maybe aren't as big and powerful as you'd like them to be. Great. Well, um, why don't we move to talk about some mirrorless cameras? Um, Alex just reviewed the Olympus OMD EM5, uh, and there seems to be, at, at least on land, there seems to be a lot of momentum um, of sort of hobbyists moving from SLRs to mirrorless cameras. And of course, all the people learning now are tend to be buying mirrorless cameras over SLRs. Um, Alex, you want to talk about your experiences with that Olympus? In, Yes, um, for me, micro full thirds had, had always been a little bit of a hollow promise um, up until this camera with the Olympus. I mean, certainly for stills photography. I think I think maybe the GH2 pushed video really, really a lot. And I think this is the camera that's really made it serious for, for stills. Um, simply because, I mean, the reviews on WebPixel, I'm not going to go over all of it now, but the image quality is, is really up there now. I mean, I certainly believe that the, the image quality from that camera matches... The, the current popular DX uh, and APS-C Nikon and Canon cameras that everyone's using. So you've got this very small package um, with all the manual controls and, and, and functionality you want that can produce these stunning pictures. I felt that certainly, you know, how we were able to use it on, on, on the review trip, that it was struggling a bit with sort of fast-moving fish photography. We had a bit of, had, you know, its continuous autofocus isn't that great. It's got great single, ser single servo, autofocus, but with moving subjects, you probably want to be able to track them. Um, and then we, we have this TTL flash lag, which hopefully might be solvable with, with some settings changes. And actually, there's a bit of a debate on the wet pixel forums about how we can get through that. Um, and uh, um, unfortunately, I didn't have the camera with me when we were doing the re when I was um, with me anymore. So I can't sort of try all the things people are suggesting. Um, but as a wide angle camera and for macro of non-moving subjects, which in reality, that's what most macro is anyway, um, it was fantastic. And what really impressed me with it was its ability in low light. Um, it's got very, very strong ISO performance, higher ISO performance. But it combines that with, with two other factors. And um, when I wrote the, the D4 review, um, Peter Rowlands made a comment in, in the editorial in, in, in Underwater Photography magazine that the ISO is so good on cameras now, you know, it really is three controls for, for, expo for, you know, for your exposure. You've got your aperture, your shutter speed, and your ISO. And where the OMD um, impressed me was that you won on all three. You know, and so when the light got low, you didn't need to stop down as much the lens because obviously the small sensor meant that you could get away with shooting at f5.6, whereas on DX you might shoot f8, and on full frame you might have to shoot f11, f13 to get the same depth of field. So you're winning there by, you know, by a stop or two. Um, on the shutter speed, the camera's got, or on the ISO, you know, 800 on there is really clean. 1600 is very, very usable. You know, I, I posted 100% crops on the on the review so you can have a look at those for, to, to put those words into, into real meaning. And even, you know, for, for a lot of uses, ISO 3200 was, was, was perfectly usable. And then you also win on the shutter speed because the camera has got in-body image stabilization, which was very impressive. I was doing handheld shots in the caves at a 15th or 10th of a second even. There's one photo I did put on there, which is a, um, a torch-lit macro shot, which is a half-second exposure, and it's sharp. 
and that's all down to the, it's not my diving skills, it's, the, it's all down to the in-camera image stabilization that moves the game on. So you win on all three ways of, of adjusting exposure. And that I found very exciting. It's, you know, there's nothing more you could ask for from a camera than it, 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 than it extending what you can do as a photographer underwater. And so for me, that was really exciting with the OMD. I felt the Olympus housing wasn't, didn't, you know, it certainly isn't up to the standard of, of the latest SLR housings. I think there's been a lot of, um, market pressure on housing manufacturers to 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 come up with you know neater and neater ergonomic solutions and you go back to a everything works but there's nothing fancy on it housing and it does feel a generation or two now behind um, you know what we're used to using on the SLR housings so that for me I thought was its biggest weakness but hopefully as other housings come online that will be resolved as well so if I mean, if the housings were were comparable um, which they probably will be in a year or two. I mean, would you recommend someone buy an SLR? If someone, you know, get, who's a serious photographer getting into underwater photography, I mean, would you recommend that they house an SLR or, or a mirrorless camera? It's an interesting one. I think it, it depends on your interests. And certainly, you know, I think the one area it's not good for is if you're a fish photographer, you, you want to shoot ID shots for ID books, you want to shoot fish behavior shots because you're interested in natural history photography. I think I found it wasn't up to speed there. Although there's actually nothing intrinsic in the system that should make it poor for that, really. But um, you don't have to use TTL, which is one of the main things that was slowing it down. Um, and you know, you could shoot perfectly well in single servo autofocus. But um, I, I felt that it was a bit behind there. But certainly for wide angle, it, it's really, really you know, worth considering. And there's, you know, there, there's a big, there's quite a big saving. As a, as a system cost, because the housings are that bit cheaper, the lenses are a little bit cheaper, they're not a big saving, but there's a huge difference in portability, both underwater and, um, and when traveling. I mean, you know, we were doing quite a lot of shore diving when we were testing it, and I just couldn't believe how light the rig was I was walking to the water with. And, you know, for a lot of people, particularly if you're just getting into underwater photography, pushing around a great big SLR is, is quite a lot to take on. Um, and if you're coming up from a compact, if you're used to using an LCD screen or a screen, as you call them these days, to do your shooting with, rather than having to look through a viewfinder, it's a very easy camera to adjust to because you've got that real functionality on the screen. It's yeah, I would just go ahead, go ahead, Ryan. It's important to remember that coming from an SLR camera, these high-end Micro Four Thirds and Sony NEX cameras are going to feel just a touch pokey, focus-wise, but for every digital SLR shooter, there are 100 people out there using compact cannons and Olympuses, and this thing feels like uh, a Ferrari compared to those, those cameras. The focus is so responsive. They have the ability to use continuous focus, which those compact users have never had before. So I think that keeping the, the experience base of the, the reviewer in, in mind is, is pretty important. Uh, there's going to be a lot of very happy compact camera users out there when they upgrade to these systems. Yeah, I, I, I thought I'd bring this along. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is um, an old because um, I'm 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 I'm, I'm at my, my parents' house today, so I've got access to things that don't normally um, travel around with me too much. This is an old Olympus OM housing for film camera. Um, it's got an old, it's got an OM10 inside it. I'll, I'll open it up because it's quite fun. One sec. Um, it's ergonomically, it's unbelievably awful. So it really shows you how far things come. It's just, you know, everything's hard to use. But it's, you can see inside there's the, it's got um, a lever control for the aperture that reaches across and spins the aperture around. I've got a zoom gear on here as well. But yeah, I thought, I thought it'd be quite a fun thing to, to show you. Yeah, have you put the EM5 in there? <laughs> facing the, the new OM, this is another old OM of mine. On this camera, I mean, ergonomically it's, it's horrible. I, you know, it's, it really is a strange thing to hold this up. They are attractive, but it's really hard to hold. Um, this, is, this is not the new camera, this is an original OM. But it's ergonomically, these very flat cameras, I do find quite hard to hold. I do think that the modern grips are much nicer to use. Anyway, I just thought it would be fun thing to share. I would just throw in on, on the uh, micro four thirds or pretty much all the mirrorless um, systems that right now the, the lens selection is still pretty limited. Uh, in, in mostly in, in macro. So, you know, what's ex exciting is, you know, these incredibly small cameras are shooting um, phenomenal results. And, and so hopefully here in the, in the next year we'll see some, some new macro lenses um, come around. Um, you know, like the, the Sony Nex is, is kind of one of my favorites. And 
Um, but you know, it's still kind of missing that that ultimate macro lens, which is underwater photographers is is a you know pretty pretty big deal for us. And and I would just throw um, I, I'd like to echo Ryan's comments that the you know I think. You know, from the user standpoint, you know, moving from a compact camera to um, one of these mirrorless cameras is is a night and day difference. Just you know, there's no shutter delay. You know, it's like there's uh, you know the focus is, is feels really zippy. Certainly, stepping down from a D4 or a Mark III or something, it, it, they do feel more sluggish. But um, you know, a lot of the frustration that um, compact camera um, users have had basically goes away um, with this. And the other interesting thing is we're seeing a lot of of, of full-size SLR shooters, you know, maybe they're on their fifth SLR body, um, you know, maybe they, just like Alex, they've got, you know, quite a treasure trove of uh, older, older film systems, and, and they're choosing these mirrorless systems because of travel ease, you know, so now you can figure an entire, um, you know, system in a backpack carried on the plane, um, and so that, that, that makes life quite a bit easier. Uh, though, though I have a bit of a rant um, on this whole travel thing because uh, a lot of times uh, you know we'll have clients that you know they'll spend five thousand eight thousand dollars and take three weeks off work to go to the other side of the world to to, to dive in that's some amazing place um, but they're worried about spending hundred and fifty dollars on excess bags and you know and so it's it's one of those things and when you put it in perspective you know the um, you know the the whole uh, the beauty of these of these small cameras is th th they are so travel friendly, but you know also you know a couple hundred bucks out of you know eight thousand dollars in a in a trip isn't that much you know just to, to travel with the gear that you really want to use and you know so that when you're on site you've got you know you've got the the cool toys to to really play with so uh, that's that's my little rant on on, uh, on travel ease. Thanks for that. I think one one point I, I'd make as well with the with the OMD or or, or similar cameras from from Sony or, or, or Panasonic or from wherever is that I could very much see myself having one as a second camera to take on trips, you know maybe taking it with just a fisheye and a mini dome. You know it's a fantastic cre um, you know system for chasing big animals in the blue. Anyone who's pushed a big DSLR around after anything out in the blue would see the advantages of a very small streamlined piece of kit. Or also as a very tiny little macro rig with a couple of, say, Inon S2000 strobes, you know, you'd have very high quality macro um, capability in something that's really small, able to get into small spaces. You know, you could build up, you know, some, you know just put tiny little arms on it and have it as a really focused little macro, a super macro rig. You know, something like that could be very interesting. You know, so I, I think, you know, it could work as a very good second camera to use for specific types of shots. I just wanted to ask Alex, really. Um, I've been uh, using the next 5 quite a lot. And I love the camera on the surface. I, I get on really well with it. But I do find that the controls on the camera, it's such a small body and the controls are so tight on the body that I find that it's quite hard to use underwater. I'm just, I'm aware that the next seven, obviously there's some improvement, and, but I was interested to hear how he felt the controls were on the OM. I think the, the I mean, the NAX5 was, you know, as everyone sort of admitted, it was, you know, very, very impressive image quality at the time, but it was quite a hard camera to use through the controls, both, both on land and, and particularly underwater. I do think it was a little bit of an exception. I think the, the NAX7 is much better. I think the Olympus is generally much better. I think with the Olympus, though, something, you know, talk about, well, during, during the review, is that you do have to get into the Olympus frame of mind. You know, it's a slightly different logic to Canon or Nikons in terms of how things work. And the more, you, but it, when it's your camera, that's obviously you get very used to that, and it's you know it's easy as a reviewer to say, oh I don't like how you had to change this, but when it's your camera, you have to you know you, you, that becomes intuitive, and it's the Nikon system or the Canon system that feels strange. So I, I found it you know, very easy to change what I wanted to change on it. Um, I preferred to use their Super Control Panel as a menu simply because that way I could just press one button and everything I wanted to control was there on one screen, and it was very easy for me to make the changes I wanted to. Um, I know other people find that, that screen a bit daunting and a bit, you know, oh my gosh, there's so much, so many options. But as a keen photographer who knew what most of those options did, I was very keen to have that all in one place. With, with any X5, it was pretty clear that Sony was trying to make a little pocket battleship, something that was totally uninterested to carry with, and there, and there were real compromises made there. 
Uh, I think they more than made up for it with NEX7, which still has, in my opinion, one of the best control layouts for topside photography, underwater photography, period, where you have f-stop, shutter speed, and ISO, all with dedicated command dials on the back of the camera. I've traveled with uh, Micro Four Thirds cameras for a few years for topside. I still use traditional SLRs for underwater photography, but the optical viewfinder for me shooting macro is just something I'm not prepared to give up. And maybe once I learn to fully realize tools like peaking and um, and using a good EVF with an accessory viewfinder, I can someday give that up, but I'm not at that stage yet. Uh, the EM5, actually, from an ergonomic standpoint, is, I think, the, the best sort of topside feel of all of these cameras that I've carried. Uh, with, with the vertical grip, where you have command dials for f-stop, shutter speed, a real kind of meaty grip, I'm looking forward to using this camera a lot topside, even if it's not going to be my first or second or third camera for underwater photography. Um, NEX7, though, someone mentioned earlier that carrying a small camera as a, as a backup or a second system, I think NEX7 is pretty amazing for that. If you have the opportunity to snorkel with dolphins, for example, you have 10 frames a second continuous shooting, a tiny little housing, a little 4-inch diameter dome port that you can free dive with without any trouble. I've been using them as pocket video cameras for underwater video for a while where I'll carry just a gorilla pod, the camera, sometimes even like an old CNC 12 millimeter Mykonos lens on the camera for, for wide angle video, something I can plant as a drop cam and come back to later. Uh, I think that from that end of the spectrum, they're a really easily managed small system. Yeah, I've been using these, uh, the mirrorless cameras for, for quite some time as well, um, mostly on land. Uh, and what I'm finding is it's my default carry around camera. Um, I, I love the image quality these days. Um, but what I do find is my my success rate in uh, is lower with uh, these with the mirrorless cameras. Um, and so you know I think if I were to use one underwater, which I am very interested in doing, um, I would probably want to use it in situations where you don't really need to focus. You know, like what, super wide angle fixed focus stuff. Uh, snorkeling with dolphins would be a perfect thing. Um, but what I find is, you know, often I think I've got, I've nailed the shot, and then when I bring it into uh, Lightroom later, I find that the eye is just a little bit out because, you know, it's very difficult to do critical focus on things like eyes. And, of course, for macro photography, that's key. You know, if the eye is out, the whole picture is blurry. Lens development here is really interesting. Like the, the new electronic zoom lens from Olympus, it's a 12 to 50 range, focuses extremely quickly. Uh, the Panasonic 14 to 42 power zoom focuses extremely quickly. So it would be interesting to see if there are more sort of modern macro lens designs in that 60, 70, 80 millimeter focal length range that, that use smaller, lighter lens elements and can rack focus faster. Um, again, more using kind of a computer to solve the problem as opposed to actual mechanical design. But uh, it's pretty promising from what I've seen from those power zooms. All right, why don't we um, try to wrap up on gear a little bit, and uh, maybe we can, we can talk about, um, especially you guys, Ryan and Burke, uh, any cool underwater photo accessories that, that you're excited about right now. Well, I'll share one. Um, you know, I think the, the really cool thing that's happened, um, you know, this year, this, I think this is going to be the coolest year for underwater photography. It kind of reminds me of the, of the first days when uh, Olympus came out with uh, the, the first plastic box, you know, for a, for a digital camera. And so it kind of democratized underwater photography in a sense that, you know, you can now get, you know, a $200 camera and a $200 housing and shoot amazing stuff. And I think the one thing that kind of really changed it too is GoPro. Um, and the, the great thing about GoPro is a couple hundred bucks, you can shoot um, photos, you can shoot video, and you can stick it in a pocket. It's, uh, you know, it's, I know probably all of us here have one mounted to whatever we're doing, or, you know, at all times. Um, we, you know, the, uh, we ended up doing a, uh, our own housing for the for the GoPro that has a little um, flat port on it, but, and GoPro has now since come out with with their own flat port housing, and, and so um, we've uh, designed a magic filter that flips up 
you know, if you can really see it, and it kind of snaps back like that. So it's a, a little mount that's on the on the the new GoPro dive housing. Which, it, by the way, it's really cool that diving is has become um, so ubiquitous that now even GoPro recognizes it. And so I think that's just kind of like a something that we should all celebrate as an industry that you know now you know we're kind of on the map. You know, it's like dive dive has made it. And uh, so the the this little magic filter. Um, snaps down into place and so you can kind of leave it on and so when you're shooting on the boat you can snap it back um, shoot stuff on the boat and then when you jump in the water um, in the shallow water you can snap the filter down and then once you pass about 30 feet then the GoPro camera really needs more light so then you'll want to um, pop the pop it up and or if you're running like video lights or something like that you can pop the filter up and use it so it is one one cool little new thing that's going to be shipping in the next couple of weeks. Is that actually a magic filter or is that... This is a, a, an actual magic filter. <laughs> so all, all the way from uh, the UK, um, we, we get the, the magic filter blanks um, from, from magic filter and then uh, laser cut them down to this, um, to this step. So it's, uh, um, we, you know, we make the, the, uh, uh, the aluminum parts, it's an aluminum mount, um, and we make all that you know, here in the states, and then uh, use the the real original magic filter, which we kind of feel is, um, you know, and all all of our tests are just blow away a lot of the other kind of less expensive gels. So, yeah, I'm hoping the magic filters become like the Kleenex of underwater color filters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> One thing I'd add, add to that, actually, on the filter front, is that the GoPro is quite an unusual camera in that it has only has auto white balance, and its auto white balance is pretty crummy. Um, it's not nowhere near as good as, say, the auto white balance on a, a Canon S95 or something. Um, so what, what, what I found with quite a lot of people is they're actually, they like the effect that using both lights and the filter gives them. So they're using the filter as available light shooting for big animals and up in the shallows. Once they go a bit deeper, they're leaving the filter in place and shooting it with, say, solar lights or something like that. And they're getting really good footage. And um, just, just one normal user sort of alerted me to this. And you know, he did a few tests and, and sent me some footage. And he just said, I much prefer the colors with it on. I still get great blues. It just, just warms everything up just the right amount. So when you are that kind of you know, two, three feet away from your buddy or the shark or whatever, and you've got your lights on, the filter actually, you know, at normal diving depths, you know, 100 feet or whatever, is actually just giving enough to warm up your, your, your artificial lights too. So, that, so you know, it's, it's just worth, worth mentioning that. And, and where can people go uh, online to see examples of filter versus no filter? Um, well, Backscatter have got a great video on their, their site. So since, since, since Burke's on, we should plug them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a the video right on the home page. Great. All right, Brian? I've got a, the... um, a, a, it's a very small thing, but it's... Um, it's, um, it's something of an exclusive, I, I think. Um, and it looks pretty normal. And it's just this, which, is, as most of you will recognize, is a, is a diffuser from an Inon. Um, but this is a new product that, that um, I've been helping Inon with. Um, and it's actually a diffuser. If I put the white thing behind it, you can see it's, it's got quite a lot of warming gel in it. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a very normal, it's a normal Inon diffuser. Um, but it allows you to warm your Inon strobes up. And hopefully, I actually had to ask Inon's permission if I could show it on this. Um, but hopefully, they're going to be releasing these soon. Um, we've just been experimenting with a few different ones over the last few months and hopefully now this one will go out and I'm going to write a, an article about it. Um, those of you, the reason you might want to, they're also making a, a clear one which some people might be, might be interested in as well. You can, I don't know if the camera is good enough to see yeah, it. Yeah, we can see it. Um, it just allows you to warm up your, your strobes. I mean, I've always felt that the Japanese make super reliable strobes that have got lots of power but they don't always have the best, the best quality of light, the, the color temperature you want. Um, and this, for me, was just a, a very simple thing that Inon could, could make that would really, you know, if anyone who's serious about the photography is using Inon strobes and you're shooting a lot in blue water, th this can really help. Um, I've written lots of articles about why you might want to warm up your strobes. Um, and they've been published on WetPixel and other places. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of people who are interested in this have already read them. Um, I'm going to rewrite that article uh, you know, with examples from this. Um, but simply, to go through it very quickly, and it's not easy to understand if you've never heard this concept before, is that 
if you have this to your strobe, you shoot your picture, your foreground of your picture is lit with a warmer color temperature of light than normal. Um, your camera has got auto white balance, or when you see the picture on Lightroom, you correct it so that your foreground has the correct colors. In other words, you, you use a white balance that cools down the picture. And where this benefits your picture is in your blue water in the background, as you cool that blue water down, you get this very rich, attractive blue water. So, to get a re so really the advantage of using this isn't in making any difference to your color of your foreground subject. Um, it's really about getting a really nice, rich blue background, which a lot of underwater photographers obviously want in the backgrounds of their wide angle shots. So, um, but I'm going to hopefully, I'm going to do some test shots, final test shots of this in the Red Sea in 10 days' time. And then after that trip, I'm going to write it up, and there should be a nice, nice article about it on WebPixel. That's great, Alex. I've, uh, one of the reasons I've stuck with the Icolites over you know, the last 10 years or so is because of that nice, warm light um, and also you know, very soft fall off. Uh, so it's mm -hmm. great to see uh, that there's some discussion, especially over in Japan, about warming up strobes. OK, Ryan? Uh, actually, I think Adam and I are on the same wavelength right here with uh, small HD monitor housings from Nauticam. Uh, it's pretty hard to argue against uh, the success, just the sort of image quality results that we see from people using digital SLRs for high definition video. The problem I've always had is I can't see what I'm doing. So <clears throat> some sort of uh, LCD monitor, preferably HD, using an HDMI feed, I think, has been the missing piece of a really good high-definition video sort of rig using DSLR cameras. Uh, I have the Nauticam housing for small HD DP4. Uh, there are other options on the market. Backscatter has a Wahoo and I think actually some European manufacturers are doing small things as well. Uh, I, I like DP4 a lot. The pixel density is great. You know, you see really sharp focus even when you crop into a one-to-one -one feed. You have shortcuts for one-to-one uh, -one and false color. They're, they're definable. I have them set for um, false color and one-to-one. -one. Usually false color is an exposure tool that, that flashes overexposed areas in red. It uh, shows underexposed areas in purple or blue, so you can have a, an easier to read in the washed out sort of bright environment. Uh, this monitor also uses a pluggable HDMI connector. So if you have a cable failure in the field, you can swap out cables on the monitor and you're not out of business. Uh, Adam, do you have something to add? Yeah, I, I uh, I've been using the, the, the small HD with the Nordicam monitor as well, the Nordicam housing as well, and uh, I mean for me the, the big issue is framing. I mean it, it just frame trying to frame using the camera's LCD is, is really difficult, and uh, and it's always a bit of hit and miss. And using a monitor, and I'm sure this is true any monitor has a massive improvement. I've also just got a I'm just going to share a picture actually of the, of the monitor in use underwater. So uh, hopefully it's a short now. So I mean, there you can see, and you can actually see that the diver that the uh, the camera is focusing on the background. And um, something that um, I think we need to think about um, with uh, with this is the uh, is the the. the the D800's output is a bit strange. I, I can't get the D800 to output any information onto the uh, monitor. But this is because it has a clean HDMI out. So the actual HDMI feed out of the D800 is, uh, is clean. So it tends not to give information. And certainly, I think possibly for the future, when it's about monitors, the next step is going to be using the uh, ninjas, the Atomos ninjas, uh, which are both monitoring and recording devices. Um, which will then give us the, the next options. I, I guess that's the next stage, really, particularly with the top-end DSLRs. Uh, does this, this housing, um, does it have focus peaking built in? The monitor does have focus peaking. It's a small HD. It calls it Focus Assist Plus. It's a artificially exaggerated sort of black and white mm -hmm. edges. It, it, it has it peaking, too, and, and I, be, I believe the, the, the wire does as well, though. But yeah, the the Wahoo's the Sony um, the Sony monitor, and and the it it has focus peaking built in, so it's very similar to the to the small HD monitor. It's, it has um, focus peaking. It doesn't have exposure assist, 
but it does pass that info from the camera. The, um, the Wahoo housing um, also now has a pluggable um, HDMI connector, so we have a right angle, really low profile right angle um, HDMI connector that will basically allow you to use it with any of the newer SLRs. So it's in, and I'd like to just say a, a few things about just the, I've been shooting, you know, we, we really made the Wahoo just because I really wanted one and no one was, no one was <laughs> making one and I had the uh, luxury to, uh, to do that. The, <clears throat> the interesting thing from a, uh, from a technique standpoint is, you know, when you are shooting video, you know, it's, it's absolutely essential because now you can, with an external monitor, you can keep the camera down low, where, which is, that's your stable um, kind of position. And you can also see out over the, um, over your camera rather than, you know, when you're looking on the back LCD, you kind of have to have the camera up, especially if you have a viewfinder on. And so you're less stable and you can't really see what's going on around you. Um, and then, of course, for macro, um, you know, I, when I started shooting macro video, I end up with hydroid stings all over my face because, you know, I was, you know, had my head stuffed down on the bottom. So, you know, obviously you can, you know, position the monitor in a, in a, in an angle that where you can actually, you know, shoot macro without and stay completely off the bottom. But the interesting thing is, you know, when you're, when you're switching between shooting photo and video um, and, and a lot of back and forth, um, all these HDMI signals have kind of a, a dropout. And so um, as, as you're making these changes, it does kind of slow down the process. So um, I, I tend to always have a monitor on, but I'm, I'm usually shooting, you know, 80% video um, in, in my work these days. Um, it, but if I am shooting stills, um, then it, you know, if I know I'm, I'm going to shoot 80% stills, then I tend to not have the monitor um, installed just because it kind of speeds up that process. Um, the new Nikon bodies are really cool in that um, even with the HDMI plugged in, the, uh, the rear LCD is still active. Um, and so on the, on the Canon bodies, once you plug in a, an external monitor, you lose your, your rear screen. And so everything has to happen on the monitor. But at, at this point, I can't, I mean, it's kind of like when the first, um, you know, like Subal came and Seacam came out with the big first optical viewfinders. And nowadays as photographers, we can't imagine diving without them. Um, it's kind of, that's the way it is for me with these um, external monitors. I just can't imagine shooting video um, without, without having one. Um, kind of, kind of critical. I think I'm gonna have to get one. I have so many fond memories of, you know, being upside down with my head in the sand, <laughs> you know, with a tripod mounted uh, SLR. So they look pretty cool. I have to quickly illustrate what peaking is, in case someone's not familiar with it. Um, I don't know. I can't see well enough to illustrate what peaking is. But this has a Voigtlander 12 millimeter mounted on it, and um, the camera, the image processor inside the camera is looking for in focus uh, sharp corners and then exaggerating those with yellow lines and then this is also fed out over monitor signals so over the HDMI connector so you could I hope you saw some peaking I'm not sure the camera's high enough resolution to pick it up but everything's in focus with this lens, so it's definitely peaking. So I'd add on focus peaking the cool thing is um, you know as you're shooting macro and say if you're on a sandy bottom and it, you're, you're moving the camera, you can actually see, um, like on the Sony monitor, it's red, red highlights on the, on the sharp bits. And so you can actually see your depth of field moving across the scene. So when you're shooting something like, say, softball size and it's kind of moving around, you can kind of watch that depth of field line and keep it lined up with your subject. So it's, it actually works really well. In wide angle, I don't think focus peaking works as well. And I usually keep it turned off um, for that because the, a lot of times you get kind of false reads on uh, areas of high contrast. Um, but when, you're, when you've got a well-lit macro scene, it's an it's, it's, it's amazing tool to, to, to maintain focus while a, a, a subject's moving. Um, since with the SLRs, we can't, you know, we don't really have live focus. You know, we have to kind of, um, you know, set up tripods and, and, and hope that the subject's not moving too much. So using an electronic viewfinder, um, the peaking information is also displayed. So actually, this I'm very hopeful that something like the Nauticam magnifying viewfinders mounted on housings like for NEX7 can make up for some of that difference that, that I see now between the, the real uh, clarity of focus I see with an optical viewfinder and what 
you can see through an inherently lower resolution um, electronic viewfinder. Is that the first uh, real, really magnified electronic viewfinder for underwater use? It's the first to my knowledge. I guess like a HD cam sort of EVF would be the only right. thing that I know of. But hopefully this narrows that gap and can bring the mirrorless systems up a notch, uh, make them even more competitive with DSLRs for underwater photography. And do you find that uh, EVF on the NEX7 to be high enough resolution to be magnified that much? Yeah, it doesn't go grainy. It doesn't go like individual pixelated. So it can definitely handle the viewfinder. That's very cool. So I, if you, uh, I have one other um, kind of new item that is kind of cool. It's the new CNC um, YSD1. And uh, Sean here at Backscatter has been doing uh, some tests on all the different strobes. And I'll share with you guys a chart. And um, so on this chart, um, uh, basically we, we kind of um, just set up a scene where you can, uh, you're about a meter away uh, from the strobe and we, uh, we test the center of the beam 12 inches out and then 18 inches out. And kind of the interesting thing is the, um, the YSD-1 is, is a really bright strobe in a really small size. So it's almost up, up there with a the YS-250. Um, and um, you know maintains a, a, you know pretty decent output all the way to to the to the far side, um, so it's it is coming in um, you know brighter than the Z two forty or the DS one sixty one, um, and I'll, uh, the interesting thing um, Alex um, had mentioned too is diffusers. Let me see if I have that chart. Oh, I think I selected the wrong one. But I think I selected the wrong one again. Well, anyway, uh, with uh, diffusers, um, what we're finding is that the uh, uh, the the strobe still comes out. Um, Uh, is that the right chart there? <laughs> there you go. All right, so now it's up. So, so here's all the same strobes with the diffuser. Um, um, and, and what we find is, is then uh, the, the YSD-1 is basically just as bright as the 250, um, you know, all the way out to the outside. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a little brighter in the center, but as it, you know, it moves out, um, it's 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 staying really bright. So the, the only downside to the D1 is it's not going to have that really fast recycle time like the 250 has. Um, it's got you know four AA batteries, and so it's you know it just doesn't have the oomph you know that that we would see with uh, with something like the 250. Um, but you know pretty amazing little strobe um, it, you know for for a really small size. So we'll be, we'll be publishing um, this test um, here probably in the next couple of weeks. I actually really like this concept. One thing I've often wondered while I'm underwater is why am I using strobes with 90 degree beam angles to light the lens like 100 millimeter macro with a 6 degree projective field of view? Just right. it never seemed to make that much sense. So YSD-1, the whole guiding principle is to throw a tighter beam, which is really useful for portrait and, and macro photography, and then widen that out with diffusers, which really probably should be called like beam modifiers because they don't cut intensity as much as you would expect them to when you look at them to be able to cover wide-angle lenses. So I actually would like to see more manufacturers kind of go this route. I'm, I'm less of a fan. I've not used the D1 yet, so um, I'm speaking purely as speculatively. Um, but I, for me, I find it's, it, the light is, you know, it, it's a bit too hard for me. I really like the light that the YS250 produces. Um, and I don't think that for, you know, if you are um, very much into your wide angle photography, I think, you know, don't see this as a cut price to YS250. You know, if you want that quality of light, get the YS250. You know, as a good all rounder, yes, but I think if you're really interested in wide angle, you know, you've got to invest in light. You know, it's amazing how many photographers will spend thousands and thousands on cameras, but they don't want to invest in strobes, and it's, it's the light that makes photography. So, you know, don't, don't skimp on the quality of light when it comes to strobe purchases. 
All right, should we, um, should we show some pictures? Let's um, just take a few minutes each and talk about uh, places you've been recently, places you're going, um, and maybe show a few pictures if you have any. Uh, do you want to start, Adam? Yeah, I just got a few pictures and I'll, just, I'll put the screen down. Um, it, they're all pretty close to home. I've not been uh, been away anywhere recently, and they're all really part of various review projects that we've had uh, we've had going on at, at Webpig. So, I get, get, does that one come up? Can you see that? Yeah, you can see it. Um, so, this is this is our local dive site, Escaping Range. It's got loads of friends trout it, but again, just trying to show the dynamic range that the camera's capable of. Um, these are just a few general kind of images, really. Um, we've got a large aeroplane to look at. Um, and then I took a trip up to the, uh, the Scottish borders to a place called St Abbs, which is on the northeast coast, um, which is fairly famous for its uh, shore diving. And um, took the, the DA hundred up there and, and shot some images um, in the sea, obviously just trying to get, try again, trying to put the camera in some decent macro subjects. Um, I've got a few bits and pieces. Uh, this next shot, I must admit, is a bit of a test shot because it's actually a crop of this crab's, uh, I think it's its pincer, but it's a tight crop. And, and you can see actually that's the grains of sand that are on the, on the crab's pincer just to show what you can do with the, with the resolution on this camera. Um, yeah, just a few kind of general images from uh, my day's diving. Uh, back, to, back to Cape Murray. And that's the... Uh, the uh, view from the surface of testing the uh, Nordicam, Aquatica, and um, Rex C, the NEX 5N housing. So, anyway, that's it from me. Um, I'll just come out of this. Um, I, I'm up next. Um, uh, you've caught me a little bit on the hop here because I wasn't, um, I wasn't ready for this. But actually, one of the, I can make a. Oh, sorry, it's not sharing for some reason. There we go. Oh, are you guys still, am I still there? Yeah, yeah, um, we, st we see a screen. Okay, is it got a crab on it? <laughs> yes, it does have a crab on it. Okay, I was, I was going to share some pictures. Um, um, a couple of months ago, I, I was able to do um, a trip to Iceland and a trip to Scotland with the, with the Nikon D4, which, it, which is phenomenal. I, I wrote it up on, on for the review on WetPixel. But I, I took on that trip um, with me the D7000 um, DX camera because I really still see the value in, in the crop sensor. And I really like the crop sensor for two things. One is all my macro, and the other is mini dome work. I don't believe that full frame is, 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 the, is a better solution for mini dome work. And so when I have the possibility to travel with two systems, I, you know, I really like to. And this is a mini dome shot taken of a sea toad. It's a type of crab we have in the UK. Um, um, and then these are some macro shots. And I just wanted to make the point that despite having you know, a D4 at my disposal, I still wanted, this is a very tiny um, little amphipod. Um, that it's bigger than the, than the um, ladybugs you get in Komodo. Um, but it's, it's still very small. Um, and these just wanted to make the point that, you know, I actually still see the value of, of the, the crop sensor cameras for certain types of shots. So despite having an all singing, all dancing new um, DSLR um, full frame camera, I, I wanted to do those trips with, with both systems. Um, but I do think in the future I could see myself very much using um, a full frame camera for, for my main wide angle as my main system, and perhaps going to a mirrorless camera for, for this mini dome and, and macro work. That's great. Burke, you have something to show? Um, yeah, let me see if I can. <clears throat> so this is uh, some video from the cenotes. And uh, I, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I, I'd done some cave training um, in the past and, and, you know, didn't really fall in love with the caves, but then down in the cenotes, I just, it's, it is so nice down there. The, you know, visibility is great. You're not dealing with a lot of currents. I really fell in love with it. Um, in this um, frame, you can, I've got the, uh, this is like ISO 2500, and I've got the, the models got uh, two um, gates lights and two, um, the, the gates VL24s and two um, Sola 4000s. Um, and so I could light up a room that I, you know, I just couldn't have done, you know, previously. So um, kind of was having fun playing with, um, 
I don't know how fast the update, I'm kind of scrolling here, um, screen update might be a little slow. Yeah, so this might not be the best um, way to share um, video, but um, so I did uh, have had a lot of fun um, uh, uh, diving into cenotes, and I'll probably just you know probably best um, if people want to check that out, we'll, we'll put a link to the video um, online. Um, also coming up um, for me this year is uh, I'm going to go to uh, the Papua New Guinea finally and go to some of Eric's haunts um, down in the eastern fields. Uh, and then we're going back to the Maldives um, for the big manta aggregation there, the Hanafaru Bay, um, kind of doing one, one final stab at it. I thought I was done with it, but it's just so amazing. Um, and we've been really lucky, so we'll see if our luck holds out again. Um, and then also in a couple weeks, we've got the digital shootout. And uh, so that, there'll be some live coverage from uh, Scuba Diving Magazine. We'll be covering that. Um, coming up, and we're hoping to have a, a Canon C300 um, going there as well. So I'm kind of really excited about that. In addition to the to the um, some of the new SLRs, so um, looks like we'll have a pretty pretty good year of, of diving and coming up. Great. Uh, I'll show a few pictures. Um, so all of us here pretty much run. We run our own trips, and uh, so you can go to Backscatter or wetpixel.com or, or uh, refoto and check out some of the, the trips that we're running. Um, one of the trips we have coming up um, is a trip to see whale sharks and Alex Mustard is leading that trip. Um, so whale sharks um, you know, are, are something that most divers really want to see and um, there's a, uh, a little spot off of Isla Mujeres which is off of the Yucatan Pen Peninsula in the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, it's a place um, where there are, there's an aggregation every summer of hundreds of whale sharks. So um, those are all whale sharks in the water, all fins. There are probably 50 or 60 in this shot on the surface. Um, and it's a, it's a fantastic place to have um, really unlimited opportunities to take any picture you want of a whale shark. You know, the full body shot, kind of the head-on feeding shot uh, right here. And, um, you know, you can get as close as you want. In fact, I took a uh, GoPro video from inside the mouth for five minutes, you know, swimming along with one uh, as it was feeding. Um, if the conditions are good, you can take split shots as well. These are unusual shots of whale sharks because most people kind of get, you know, get uh, their 30-second shot as one swims by. Um, but you can really spend hours here um, just working with the animals um, and let, really letting, you don't have to chase them at all. They just approach you if you hang out there. Uh, this is what they're, they're doing. They're what they're, they're doing. They're, they're feeding on these little tiny eggs, um, and after a day of snorkeling around, you end up covered in these eggs, and they, they collect in your skin or your wetsuit. Um, and so we took a few shots of these things. You can also do a little bit of free diving down and get um, nice sunburst shots, although you know, big head covering the sunburst kind of shots. And if you're really lucky, you can get the same shot of one pooping, and um, <laughs> You know, a pooping animal shot is always better than a non-pooping animal shot in my book. It's all about <laughs> behavior. Yeah, that's right. It's all about behavior. Um, and so if you're interested in this, uh, wetpixel.com slash expeditions, uh, and you'll see a list of all the trips that we're running this year. Uh, Ryan? Uh, I think you're muted, Ryan. Maybe I could supply the voice for him. <laughs> so here are some rubbish pictures that I took. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I clicked the wrong mute icon. Don't click the red one. Click the one at the bottom. Uh, Kevin Palmer from our store got back from the Philippines uh, yesterday. He had D4 and D7000 with him, and they got some pretty incredible stuff. Um, I can't think of any place else right now that has as much sort of different things going on in the same relatively local geographic area. So whale sharks in Oslo, uh, thresher sharks in Malapasco, uh, amazing manta stuff in uh, Tubataha. I'll pick a couple of these out to share. This is the Oslo whale shark feeding, if you will where the local fishermen are um, baiting, feeding some of the smaller whale sharks in with uh, krill. Uh, 
And the thrashers, I think, are breathtaking. Um, this is shot at ISO 2000 with a D4. The red channel noise is not offensive. I think they said they had up to eight thrashers at the same time. And some macro shots from any lab too. This is a ocean or a white tip shark portrait with a 105 millimeter macro lens. Nice mantis. So I think Kevin did a really good job showcasing what the D4 can do to give us a bit of a warm water contrast to what Alex shot in Iceland and Scotland. And the results are pretty great. That's great. Thanks, Ryan. Um, are there any, uh, is there anything else you guys want to talk about before we, we sign off here? Um, we do have one question from uh, the Google Plus page from uh, Alex Safanoff, which is directed at Alex. Uh, he says, Alex, I remember you had the honor to present your work to the Queen of England. How did she react, and did you convince her to try diving? <laughs> well, um, probably for her it was as much of a highlight as, as the 60 years on the throne that she's celebrating this weekend. Uh, meeting me, um, I'm certain of that. Um, but I'm um, joking aside, um, the Queen actually is um, a keen photographer on land, so she was actually quite interested in, um, in, in, in understanding what went on into the, into the photo. Um, and Prince Charles, um, her, her son, is um, a, um, a keen diver, and he's been the, the president of the British Subacqua Club. So maybe we'll, we'll get one of the royal family into underwater photography. Maybe, maybe it's the next generation. Maybe it's, it's Prince William or Prince Harry who you know, will take their grandmother's interest in photography and combine it with their father's interest in diving, and we'll have the first, the first royal um, underwater photos. You think they'll, they'll do some reviews for WebPixel? <laughs> oh, definitely. Oh, well, I mean, you know, they definitely you know, want to. Whether we'll accept them or not, I don't know. <laughs> okay, anything else? No? Okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Thanks for participating, guys. I know it's been uh, a long 90 minutes. Um, but this, is, this has been great, and hopefully we'll have many more in the future. Um, we've had a whole bunch of questions about... Uh, environment and eco, you know, ecosystem conservation. Um, and I think each one of these will, be, will have a different theme. So this one was quite gear heavy, um, but it be, would be fantastic to talk about destinations and sort of um, you know, more experiential stuff in future Hangouts. Um, so thanks, everyone. And um, I think we lost our masks. Where are all our masks? <laughs> if everyone can just wave goodbye, uh, we'll sign off. So, there we go. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for watching, guys. See you underwater. Bye.